Well, welcome everybody. Welcome back to our small but mighty Bible study as we continue through some of the shorter books of the Bible. And we have one more class next week after tonight. But for tonight, our uh, study will focus on 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and really look more so at 1st John because 2nd and 3rd John have a lot of parallel going on there. So let me open us with a word of prayer and then we will begin. Blessed Heavenly Father, we are truly grateful for your word. Thank you for teaching us more about who you are and your ways that are above our ways. Thank you for giving us understanding and thank you so much for your grace that has been coming to us through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, uh, who knew all about putting his life on the line for our salvation. So Lord, tonight be with us through the power of your Holy Spirit and teach us what it is we need to know to live for you through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we had a good discussion in the first class today on uh, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And I asked them the same question I'm going to ask you. What did you think of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John? Overall impression. I thought, it was, I, I thought the, at least the first one, I, it, I read it yesterday, I think it was. Uh, it was very, I thought it was pretty repetitive. Oh. It kept repeating the same stuff over and over again. Okay. It was so the, same, the same themes, I mean, the same stuff over. Yeah. 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 And I also thought that it was some kind of, um, parts of what it was saying was kind of a little scary. It seemed a little bit more contrary because he kept saying, you know, those who are from God are free of sin. Those who are not free of sin are, you know, like, uh, you know, going to hell and all that. I'm saying, well, I, none of us are free of sin, so how is that going to, how does that equate with what Jesus said that, you know, you were saved, you're, Jesus came to save you from your sins. So he was, some of the stuff he was saying seemed a little contradictory mm -hmm. okay. to me. You agree? There was a lot of repetition. I think it should be, should have been called the love letters. Because, oh, the love letters, okay. Right, because, I mean, he talked a lot about, you know, how we should love everybody, and mm -hmm. uh, I like that part better than the sin part. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, none of us are without sin, and I mean, the way, the way he talked, like, like, I don't know, like we should be. Mm. But, mm -hmm. yeah. I didn't get that part. Well, we'll look a little more deeply into that. And uh, there is a context uh, for this letter. So there's a lot going on. Uh, John didn't just write these letters out of the blue. There was a context. So we'll get to that, which may help flesh out some of the repetition and some of the talk about sin, as well as love and, and what's going on with all of that. So, okay. Anybody else? Any other did you find some uh, familiar verses in yeah, these yeah. books? Yeah, the one about beloved, let us love one another. Yes, we were talking about that. Where have we heard that one before, Armando? Beloved, let us love one another. Well, I've heard it many times before, so I'm not sure. It is a song, yes. Beloved, oh, oh, yeah. let yeah, us yeah, love it, one another. It's, like, it's a pretty, pretty well quoted verse. Yes, yes. So. Yeah, there were a number of them in uh, First John. So uh, I'll try and highlight those as we go along. But let's talk a little bit about John himself because <clears throat> these letters are written by John who is believed to have been the same person who wrote the fourth gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you'll see some parallels there with the gospel. And also, not only writing these three books, but also the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, all right? He lived, he was the last disciple that's believed to, out of the 12, that was alive. He was the last one before he was martyred. He was the disciple uh, that was exiled to Patmos and uh, stayed there until his death and uh, wrote quite a bit, as you can see. So five books of the Bible are attributed to him, most likely, most likely. The... The three letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, are epistles. Remember we said epistle means what? Letter. Letter. But these are known not as um, the 
other kinds of epistles like Pauline epistles. These are known as Catholic, small c, or general epistles. Any idea why? Because they're not specific enough. I mean, they're not really directed at, you don't know who who they're going to, there's no specifics on anything in there. It seems to be mentioning every, everybody. I mean, he'll, he'll mention men and boys and they're generic. women, yeah, just a lot well, of Well, there are different. salutations, right? Because the third one is written to whom? Gaius. Gaius. The second one is written to whom? The lady, have a note. <laughs> I most certainly do have a note. It's in my car if you'd like to go get it. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Um, the second one is written to the elect lady and her children, although we don't have a name. And the first one really doesn't give us anything. They're called general or um, Catholic because they're not written to a specific church. Like Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus or the church in Corinth. It's not like that with this one. These are written in general, and we're not exactly sure. There's been a lot of, a lot of research done, but nobody is very sure about to whom it was written. As you know, here's John writing these letters. They had to go from where he was to somebody somewhere. But there's nothing in these letters that really specifies. So they're called Catholic or general. Okay. So very unique. So... <clears throat> Other than that, I couldn't tell you where they ended up. I couldn't tell you exactly where he was when he wrote them. We don't have much. Some believe he was in Ephesus. Some believe he was in Patmos. We really don't know. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to spend most of our time tonight in 1 John. Because that's really the bulk of our reading. And you will see the parallels with 2 John and 3 John. Okay. So let's look at the very beginning of First John. And if somebody would read, this is a very peculiar way to start this letter. The first four verses of First John. If somebody would read those, please. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands. Concerning the word of life, this life was revealed, and we have seen it and testified to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Okay. Interesting way. To start a letter. Usually it's dear so and so, but not in this case. Anything strike you about the way this starts? Kind of seems like a little bit of it. Same formation, the same way as the beginning of the Gospel of John. How so? Because we're talking about the Word and how Jesus was, was with God, you know, that whole piece mm -hmm. of just. Uh, it, just, it just strikes me kind of similar. Okay. Because it's, it's not very specific in many ways. It's, it's kind of put out there in a very generic way. But yet, there is a repetition here that comes to light. Um, we are declaring, we, meaning John and whoever's with him, we are declaring to you, whoever's reading the letter, or hearing the letter, what was from the beginning, that may be where that parallel comes, John, in the gospel, because it says, in the beginning was the word, okay? What we have heard, what we have seen, what we have looked at and touched. And then a little further down, um, this life was revealed, we have seen it, we testify to it, we declare to you. Of course, they're talking about the eternal life. So what is that? Who is that? Jesus. That's Jesus, right? John, if he's the disciple John, would have seen Jesus, right? He would have heard him. He would have even touched him. Um, he was in his presence. So John is bringing that at the very beginning of the letter. What is he trying to convey? You know, any notion? Why would you talk like that to people? Because 
because you want them to know Jesus. Okay. And how would they be getting to know Jesus if you opened up that way? Through fellowship with those that knew him, that heard him. Right, people that were actually, they experienced Jesus, right? I mean, John would have been in his presence. We know a couple of stories where John is specifically mentioned, right? Where Jesus is with the disciples and sometimes he would take Peter, James, and John aside. So John had some special insights uh, with Jesus that some of the disciples, uh, the rest of the disciples did not have. Um, so John is bringing that to the forefront and he's saying, listen, I saw Jesus. I listened to him. I touched him. Um, do you know what would have been at least one of the times that John touched Jesus? When he came out of the, when he saw him in the garden? Um, maybe, but there's one that we could be pretty sure that he actually touched Jesus. That's extra credit. <laughs> I never was good at extra credit. <laughs> <laughs> How about at the uh, Last Supper? When John leaned over on Jesus, the disciple has believed to have been John. Who, so he, yeah, if he was leaning that, on Jesus. Uh, that they would have had to touch Jesus. Or, I mean, they, they were hanging out with him the whole time, so why wouldn't they touch him? Sure, sure. But that could be, you know, directly to him. But he, anyway, he's bringing that to light. Now, there, we'll get to why that is going to seem so important as we go through this reflection on First John. But there is a definite reason why he's talking that way. Okay, so we'll get back to that. Then when you move on in this first chapter, you go all the way from verse 5, chapter 1, verse 5, and you go down through chapter 2, verse 17. If you look at that section, you hear a lot about what Carol was talking about, which is sin and righteousness. Um, for John, he liked to juxtapose what two things when he would talk about sin and righteousness. Can I have extra credit for that one? Come on. Light and dark. Yes, very good. The light and the darkness. <laughs> yes, very good. Yes. Yeah, he liked that. Um, in John's Gospel is where Jesus says, I am the light of the world, chapter 8. And then he says, Jesus says, you, meaning my followers, are the light of the world. So that's not unusual. Um, in the opening chapter of the Gospel of John. Uh, he came into the darkness, and the darkness did not, what? Overcome him. So there's, there's John talking again, darkness and light. So there's some parallels there. But when he deals with sin, what are some of the things that he says about sin here in this section? From like verse 5 down to verse 17, and I know he even talks about it later on, but in this section, what else does he say about sin? If I remember, you can't be with Jesus if you are full of sin. Yeah, those two things don't go together. Right. Because, why? Jesus has no sin. Right. He's sinless. We see that in here. This is one of the, one of the books of the Bible that testifies to Jesus being without sin. Okay. Very important. Because if Jesus had sin, his death on the cross would have done nothing. Right? Mm -hmm. He had to be the pure lamb, the pure sacrifice. But what else in there about sin? What if you do have sin? What do you do? He keeps trying to push sinners to Jesus because it's Jesus is going to be the one that washes that sin. You know, he died for our sins. Yeah, he and pretty the much. The only way you're going to be absolved or forgiven or whatever is through Jesus. They had, see, yeah. everybody keeps repeating the same thing. Yeah. You know, you have to say, well, it's Jesus, though. But then, you know, you're going to sin this way. But. There's the light. Jesus is there. They keep pushing. Yeah. Yeah. It seems. To. Yeah, definitely. He keeps pointing back to Jesus, which is a good thing, because he he says. But we have to conf confess our sins. Right. And how about that section? We've heard that before, haven't we, Carol? Verses nine. Right. Uh, eight and nine. Right. Mm -hmm. Why don't you read that for us? 
if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Have you heard that before? As Presbyterians, when we prepare to confess our sins together, you'll hear pastors sometimes read those verses as a call to confession. It's a beautiful thing, you know, talking about how we are to come clean of our sins, and that comes through confession uh, to Jesus, and that he is forgiving and cleanses us from our unrighteousness. So we've definitely heard that before, and he puts Jesus right at the forefront when we're dealing with sin. So that's another familiar passage. And to me, that's a good thing because we go directly to God mm -hmm. uh, you know, to confess our sins. We don't have a middle man. Jesus is the middle man, isn't he? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. Very Protestant thing to do. We do our, our, our confession corporately, as we call it, together. Right. Yep. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so sin, he, he's going to talk a little bit about sin in this, in this uh, section as well. And then he gets into, um, he not only talks about Jesus as our Savior, which is the saving part, the, the crucifixion part, but he also talks about the Lordship of Jesus. And when Jesus is your Lord, what is it that's required of you? Like in verses 3 and following. Obedience yeah. to the commandments. Yeah. The Lord gives you the direction, and you are to follow. You are to obey. So John is very good at showing us the saving grace of Jesus, but also the lordship of Jesus. He doesn't place one over the other. He puts them both out there for us. Because that's what we profess, right? When we become a Christian, Jesus is my Lord and my Savior, both. So he's very good about that as well. <clears throat> And then he gets into, what is the commandment? In verses 7 and following. In fact, it seems to be that there's a little teaching that needs to happen here in this section about the commandment. What is the commandment, basically? Love one another. Love one another, right? Mm -hmm. um, whoever says, verse 9, whoever says, I am in the light, while hating a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Whoever loves a brother or sister lives in the light, and in such a person there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates another believer is in the darkness, walks in the darkness, and does not know the way to go, because the darkness has brought on blindness. So again, he's using light and darkness, seeing, blindness, but he's talking about how can it be that if you say you hate a brother or sister, and he's talking in the church now, this is all about in the church. Um, he gets to the world in a little bit, but right now he's talking about in the church. If you hate a brother or sister, how can you say you're in the light? How could you say that you are loving God if you're not loving your brother or sister? It, very clear. I mean, couldn't be any clearer than that, the way that John's expressing that. So very important there. Um, and then he, you know, he goes through admonition for children, admonition for young people, fathers, and he repeats that again and again. And then he gets to verse 15, and now he's talking about what? The world. The world. What does he say about the world, Carol? Um, you're of the world, but you shouldn't love the things of the world. Mm-hmm. And what are some of those things? Um, let's see. Lust, boasting, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. cravings of sinful men. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a Christian is supposed to relate to the world a certain way. Don't love the world. Right. right? Don't love the things of this world. And... Verse 17 sums it up. What does he say there? The world and its desires pass away. 
But the man who does the will of God lives forever. Interesting, isn't it? What's going to be around forever? God and? Who else? Heaven. Those who do his will are. No, yeah. People that are believing that do his will are going to be around Yeah, forever. the followers of Jesus are going to be around forever. But what's not going to be around forever? The world. The world and everything with it. You're going to outlast the world. You are here, yes. <laughs> yes, you are. And you're going to outlive the world. Pretty powerful stuff when you think about it. Some, you know, when we, when we think of dying, a lot of times we, we think about... Numbers. Well, numbers, yeah. And, you know... I mean, like you say, well, let's say my parents died when they were such and such. I wonder if I'll meet that number or, you know... Uh, yeah. you, you measure things in numbers. Yeah, you measure Basically. things in a worldly way, right? Right. But in actuality, as a believer, we can think of leaving the world behind because we're going to outlive the world, which is a whole different perspective, isn't it? I mean, think about that for a minute. It's not... You're leaving the world, but the world's not always going to be there as we know it. But we're going to be around forever. It's hard to imagine. Yeah, it is. He's talking about divine things here. That's sometimes hard for our little human minds to, to really capture. Mm -hmm. But that's what he's saying. There's a difference between forever and not forever. <laughs> Mortal or and immortal. Eternity. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> But as a believer in Christ, as a follower of Christ, you're part of the eternal category, not the mortal category anymore. Well, he's, he's really biting off a lot of stuff, isn't he? Yeah. And it gets better. All right. And then if you didn't think that was interesting enough, and if you thought that Revelation was the only place that the Antichrist was mentioned, right? Voila! John, the same author, talks about the Antichrists, plural, here in 1 John. What does he say about the Antichrists? He says they're already here. Yeah. I can think of a few. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, when, like you said, when you, when you hear that word, you think revelation. Yeah. Because you think that you're waiting for this beast or whatever to, you know, yeah. come upon the world. But, yeah. like he says, they're already here. Yeah. So let's look a little more into that because that is pretty interesting. A lot of people don't know that he talks about it here. <clears throat> um, who are these antichrists? I think he's referring to uh, people that are non-believers in Jesus. Okay, That's where do you get that from? Well, he says, uh, 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 is, uh, I heard that you heard that the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come from this, we know the last hour, then he goes, they went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. All right. but by going out, they made it plain that none of them belongs to us, and he goes on to say, you have been anointed by the Holy One, and all of you have knowledge, blah, blah, blah. Then he wants to say, who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. The one who's denying Jesus is the Antichrist. The one who denies the Father and the Son. Mm -hmm. So I think he's kind of talking about pretty much anybody who's denying uh, God and uh, Jesus being the Son of God. Okay. Let me ask you this. Go back to verse 19. He says, They went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. Who, who are these? What's, who, what is this? Who are they and who are us? And well, uh, us, he, this is John talking, so it would have to be uh, people that uh, are believers. Mm. Right. They were us. Which we call, what's a group of believers called? 
Christians. Christians make up the the church. The church. Okay. So he's talking about these people who went out from us. So if us is the church, they went out from the church. These they. And the they is who? Who went out from the church? The, the, the Antichrist. The people denying. Yeah. In other words, there's been a separation. There's been a, a division here. So John is talk he's he's differentiating here. He's he's saying, here are the Antichrist, here's where they came from, here's where they went, and here's why they are considered out of the church. And here are the people in the church. And what's the main differentiation between the Antichrist and the believers? In here is what? They really didn't believe. They really, I don't know how to say this right. They really didn't believe. In? In that Jesus was our Lord and Savior, and they didn't believe that he was the Son of God. Yeah. In fact, in verse 22, he said, Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Christ is the Greek word for what? Do you know? The Hebrew term, the anointed one, or the Messiah, right? And the Messiah was, people were supposed to be waiting for the Messiah, right? Because of our sin issue, right. and we needed to be saved from sin, and we couldn't do it ourselves. So we needed the Messiah to come. So he's saying there are people, and he's calling them liars or antichrists, because they are denying that Jesus is the, the Messiah, the one who denies the Father and the Son. That God sent Jesus, his Son, to be the Savior of the world. So what you're beginning to see here is John is, is writing to help people differentiate between the true believers and the not true believers, or the false believers, or the false prophets, if you will. There's beginning to be a division in the church. And that's what you're seeing in, in these letters that John writes. Is there any either information or um, theory on what the bit, what happened? Why? Because mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that kind of seems interesting. It's like, all right, wait a minute. What what happened that all of a sudden people started denying? Yep. If well, they, if they allegedly believed in the beginning. Right. So what? Yeah. What's happening here? Why? Why? Why is he writing this way? Just to top it off, go to verse twenty-six. I write these things to you concerning those who would deceive, deceive you. Is that whatever he has in the translation? Deceive you. So in other words, there's deception. Now, anytime there's deception, who's the great deceiver? Satan. 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 The devil. And of course, we know he's, he talks about the devil later on, or the evil one. So there, there's some serious stuff going on here. Uh, there are some serious teachings that are being taught that are not of the doctrine of Christianity. And that's why John is writing this letter. And that's why he wrote the second letter and the third letter. Because remember the third letter, there were two guys who were mentioned. Mm -hmm. D and D, right? And Diot Diotrephus, <laughs> easy for you to say was going off, wasn't he? And he was teaching something else, and John was not happy about him. But Demetrius, he said, he's in line. He's teaching what we should be uh, proclaiming. So, again, evidence of there's, there's something going on here that's happening. So we'll get to that. Hold that in tension. There's tension here, so hold that for a second. Okay. Um, let's see. And, th and that deception goes on into chapter 3. If you look at um, verse 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. And then everyone who commits sin is a child of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose. To what? To destroy the works of the devil. Destroy the works of the devil. So again, he's tying it all together. It's, it is repetitive, but he's bringing it all together each time he brings it up again. He's, he's show, trying to show the big picture here. 
So let's let's get to the head of this thing. Go to chapter four and let's see what's said there. How about if somebody reads four one through three? Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. Okay, so test the spirits because there's a spirit out there that is not teaching the truth. And what is the key teaching? Jesus came in the flesh. Mm -hmm. Jesus came in the flesh. So that must mean the teach people are teaching what then? He didn't come in the flesh. He came in spirit only. Aha, uh -huh. yes. There's one of the greatest controversies in the early church. How much of Jesus was human? How much of Jesus was divine? Was he totally human? Was he totally divine? Was he 50-50? Was he 25-75? I don't know, 10-90? What do you think? He was probably a spirit that inhabited a person who was already alive and took over <laughs> their body. <laughs> That's the issue. That's the issue here. Because some people were teaching that Jesus, mm, that fleshly part of Jesus. Well, let's see this. How do we know Jesus had flesh? How do, how do we know he was human? What's the proof in the Bible? There's a lot of it. What, what are some wow. of the proofs? He bled. He bled. Spirits don't bleed, right? Okay. He, well, this might not be right, but he stumbled you know, like he stumbled and fell. Okay. He um, ate and drank. He ate and drank. Spirits yeah. don't eat and drink. You know, so. Mm -hmm. What else did he do? Spirits he die. Spirits don't die. Mm -mm. He died too. He wept. He wept. My goodness, spirits don't weep. So, people are looking at that, and the flesh, all these things, stumbling, having to eat, get, getting hungry, getting thirsty, bleeding, dying, are all signs of the weakness of being of the flesh. Do we want a weak Jesus? Mm, some people didn't. Some people didn't want to emphasize that part of Jesus. The context for John and, and his world was much of the Greek influence here, as well as the Jewish influence. But the Greeks, if you go back to this time, you had different schools of philosophies about reality. Some of them were Stoics, some of them were Hedonists. Do you know what, how to define those, those groups? What's a Hedonist? All pleasures. Yes, all indulge, pleasure. right? All go and drink and gamble and have sex and my goodness, who cares? Just have fun because it doesn't matter. The Stoic, on the other hand? Resist. Yes, resist. Don't don't meddle with the flesh. In in uh, religious terms, or in another religious philosophical term, some of these people were known as Gnostics. Did you ever hear that Gnosticism? G N O S T Gnostics. That in the Greek means knowledge. So some people would say, we don't want to deal with the the fleshly part. I mean, flesh is corrupt, it, it's mortal, it's sinful, it's got lusts, mm, we don't want to deal with that. So let's just emphasize the divine part of Jesus, because that's a lot better. It, it seems like that's more like God. You know, why would Jesus want to mess with the rest of being fleshly? Although John does say he was without sin. But there were people that said, we don't want to mess with that. So what's happening is John and some of the people like John are saying uh, but you have to deal with the fleshly side of Jesus there's a lot to that it's not just that 
he had human flesh, but there's a lot more that need that needed to happen that way. Where others are saying, you know what, Vicky, you may not quite get it yet, but you want to revel in the fleshly side of Jesus, that's great. But Carol and I, we'll be over here when you're ready. You come on up to our level and, and we'll, 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 we'll enlighten you. We'll, we'll share more light with you because that's a little bit too dark for us. What's happening there? We're in the church. What's happening when we do that in the church? You're separating. Yeah. Now, and in such a way that you are aware and we're aware. You're on that side and I'm on this side, so there's a division there. And even more so. It's like one is better than the other. Yes. Yeah. There's a hierarchy now. We know more. <laughs> Shh. We'll keep it a secret. <laughs> She'll get it one day. Eh, if she does, fine. If not, we're on our way, Carol. <laughs> See what I mean? Yeah. This is what was happening in the church. People were beginning to differentiate in a, in a superior way. And that's what John is knocking up against. Because why does he emphasize so much about the fellowship and love your brother or sister and not hate your brother and sister? He says, how could you be in the light, you and I, Carol, when we're looking down on a sister in Christ? He's saying, no, that doesn't jive. See? So there's a lot at stake here. And he's trying to counter all that because you have these people going out and they're teaching these things, which may seem like not a big deal. Theologically, it is huge because what is the, what is the doctrine of Jesus in the flesh? What do we call that? It begins with an I. Became incarnate. Right, the incarnation. Important? Yeah, because he, he could uh, experience everything. He had to be a human being. He had to be human. And why is that so important for us Otherwise as believers? Otherwise, wouldn't be able to die for our sins if we didn't experience everything we were doing. And I think we could relate to mm him. -hmm. That was, yeah. that's me. And we could relate to him and he can relate, relate to, to us, us right? Because if I'm in pain, I could look at Jesus and say, well, you know about pain. pain. Um, if I'm dying, I could look at Jesus and say, well, you know what it was like to die. Um, if I'm suffering, if I'm being ridiculed, any of the negative things that we experience in life, because we're human, the weakness, we could look to Jesus and say, you get it. You get me because you were me. Yeah. See? So it's crucial to have that. These people that didn't want to look at that side of Jesus were going to lose out. And John knew that. Plus, one of the most important things about Jesus is when he left heaven, he came a certain way. When he went back to heaven, was he the same? No. no. Why not? No. When he came down to earth, he was made man. Okay. Right? So when he left heaven, when what was he? When he left heaven, he, he what? I, he, he always was. How do I say this? So I know what I'm trying to say just That's won't okay. come out right. <laughs> <laughs> um, he was a deity. Right, he was divine. Okay, he was divine. Mm -hmm. Son of God. So, but to relate to us, he couldn't be that deity, um, for lack of better terms, that deity, because I could relate to the man. Okay. But I would have a hard time relating just to a deity. As a kid, and it's it's awful. I always thought God the Father was mean and nasty, mm -hmm. terrible. Mm -hmm. But I loved Jesus because he was the nice guy. <laughs> yeah. And 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 he went up to heaven to show that hey, I already did my work here, guys. Now you have to do it, and and but I'm up there, but I see everything you do, <laughs> and I'll help you any way I can. You know, type thing. Right. Well, let me ask you this. I don't know how to put it in good When Jesus, terms. you're right. In fact, we can't even call him Jesus when he's in heaven because he's really not Jesus yet, right? Right. When does he get his name Jesus? When he, when he was born and he took him to the temple, right? Right. And they and said, who do you call? They call him Jesus. And God said, you're going to, angel said, you're going to name this yeah. kid Jesus, right? right? Which means he who saves, Savior, okay? So when he is up in heaven, we refer to him like John did in, in the gospel. 
in the beginning was the word. word. Yeah. He's called the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's not even called Jesus yet. Second person of the Trinity, sometimes we call him as, as Christians. Comes down, he has no flesh. Comes down, takes on human flesh. When he dies, does he get rid of the flesh? No. I mean, when he's raised from the dead, does he get rid of the flesh? No. How do we know? Because they saw him and they touched him. Yeah. And they saw the hands. They saw the side. They, they saw, they still saw the wounds, which a spirit doesn't have wounds. And he ate. And then he ate with them, of course, yes. And then when he goes to heaven, when he ascends, does he leave the flesh behind? I don't think so. No, he doesn't. So the way he came down is not the way he went back up. Why would it be so significant for Jesus? Because think about it, he's at the right hand of the Father. So now humanity, human flesh, is now up in heaven next to the Father. Why would that be so significant? So that following him, we also can, we're not, we won't be constrained by the flesh. Right, yeah, guess what? We're gonna go up because in, where is it now? Where does it say it? <clears throat> when he is revealed, we will be the same. Oh, where is it now? <laughs> Should have written that down. In other words, and I'll find it, when Jesus is revealed, we will be like him, which is another one of the famous verses of John, 1 John. When he is revealed, which means at the end of time, we will be like him. And I'll find it. But in other words, Jesus is the first one to raise humanity up to heaven. The rest of humanity who believes in him, who is saved, will follow. So Jesus never, he never went back to the Father the same way. Maybe three, two, and three. Let's see me down in the wall. Yes, yes, thank you. Three, two. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him for we will see him as he is. So we're going to be like Jesus. If you wonder what you're going to be like in heaven, you're going to be like Jesus. A man? <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted to be a man. I have an easy time. <laughs> if I come back, I want to be a man. <laughs> and now you're going to matter, Carol. <laughs> Yes. So in, in the essence of who we are, we will be like Jesus. <clears throat> there are a lot of things, isn't it? Like we're going to be here long after the world is gone. In heaven, we're going to be like Jesus. A lot of good stuff coming out of John, isn't there? Hmm. But that's what was going on here. Hence, if you have people that are denying the fleshly side of Jesus, now we understand why John opened up his letter the way he did. Now go back and look at what he wrote. He emphasized the physicality of Jesus. See? Because he was trying to, again, argue that that was important. Very important. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. This is the book where we learn that God is what? Love. love. God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. What else do we learn about love here in verse 17 or 18 and following? There 
is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Yes, there's a relationship between love and fear. Hmm. That's pretty interesting. And we love why? Yeah. The only thing we know about love is what God has taught us about love. And then he goes again. Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. See it in the context here? Mm -hmm. The flesh is important. Even the community of believers, the fleshliness of living with brothers and sisters in a community of faith with other human beings is critical. Because how can we say we love God if we don't love one another? Because Jesus, even Jesus, had human flesh. Okay. That's why you're seeing the repetition. He's constantly making his case against the Gnostics, basically. The people who, you know, it's basically saying um, we're superior to the other parts of the Christian church, the other believers that aren't quite up to where we are yet. And that, that was that division that could only be overcome by everybody loving each other equally. That there wasn't this inequality like that. It wasn't about the knowledge. It was about the community. Now, let me go back to my question. How much of Jesus was human and how much of Jesus was divine? <laughs> Does it matter? Mm -hmm. Well, the church wrestled with this for a couple hundred years. Well, they don't know. <laughs> well, they came up with something called the Nicene Creed. You remember that one? Yes. Okay. How about the Nicene Creed? Don't you love that one? I'd rather the Apostles' Creed any day. Why? Because repetitive, Carol, right? True God from true God. Light from light. Blah, blah. And you're like, how many times do we say the same thing? This is why. They wanted to be so specific about who Jesus is and who he isn't. He is both fully human and divine. Fully human and fully divine. And we call it, guess what the answer of the church was? Guess how they explain it? They say it's a mystery. Oh. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Okay. Because at communion we say great is the mystery of faith. 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 Yep. Great is the mystery of faith. We believe it. Maybe not really... We can't explain it down to the last letter, but we believe it. We believe he's fully human and fully divine. How that happens, we don't know. That's the reason why Jesus, or God, could experience death. Because through the flesh that died, God experienced, he tasted death. God didn't die, but he experienced death through that. And now humanity can experience heaven eternal life so that they they were conjoined in such a way such a mysterious way that they both related to the attributes of one another if you will in Jesus and I don't want to go any further than that because it gets a little heady after that but that's basically what you're talking about there he was both and he had to be both that was the only way we could be saved Comments about that or questions? Like I said, John 2, John 3, more of the same, just shorter versions. Um, I, I didn't really want to spend that much time on those because if you were to read back through the three of these again with all that fill now, all that context, it would make more sense why he wrote the way he did. But let's talk about the contemporary application of these things. We've already talked about the importance of the Incarnation and why that's so incredibly important. Um, what about truth and fellowship in the church? Is there tension sometimes between those two things? What? Between truth and fellowship or community. Do we see tension here in this letter between those two things? I think there's some question on people are, have different truths. Mm, okay, so 
trying to discern the truth could lead to what in the fellowship? Disruption, disagreement. Yeah, it could, it could. Is that, have we ever seen that happen? <laughs> <laughs> you can think historic church. You don't have to think yeah. contemporary church necessarily, but, well, but historic. Contemporary wasn't like until what, 84? Oh, you talk about the Presbyterian. Presbyterian Church. What happened in eighty three? Oh, I don't know. I was I was booted out. So I don't know. Oh well, eighty three. Does anybody remember what happened in nineteen eighty three? Yes, but not not regarding the church. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's narrow it down here. <laughs> nineteen eighty three was the reunion of the Northern Presbyterian Church and the Southern Presbyterian Church. That's when they merged again. Right. But they had been a schism before and they had yeah. been apart. And what was the schism over? That I'm not sure. Slavery. North and South. Slavery. Yeah, the whole slavery issue. Yeah, a so lot of the denominations. in the 1800s then, if it was yeah. the slavery issue. Yeah. Yeah. They were trying to get back together, but it was until 83. So that's one. Anytime there's been a schism, there's probably been an issue over truth and fellowship, right? Um, Martin Luther. Big one for us as Protestants. What was the schism all about there? What was the truth that was at stake there? The uh, grace uh, that we are saved by grace as opposed to by doing good works and paying money to the church. Right? Yeah, yeah. So the higher ups Pope. didn't want to believe that. <laughs> what? And the Pope. <laughs> well, and the money and, yeah, and yeah. the power yeah. and yeah, yeah, and the coffers. But yeah, that that was a tension that eventually led to a split. Um, you can go back even further to the, the schism, the Great Schism, 1056 between the Eastern Church and the Western Church. That was really the first big split uh, where you ended up with the Orthodox churches and the Western Church. And it was in that Western Church later on that you had the Protestant Reformation. But even after the Protestant Reformation, we see splits, you know. There's still uh, reforms, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yep. We're, we're of the reformed faith oh yeah so yeah there is that's that's a tension the church always has to deal with you know what is the truth what is the truth because we believe in an objective truth that's why we get in trouble in the world don't we because in the world it's all about well what's true for you is true for you and what's true for me is true for me and let's all just get along but alternative facts <laughs> <laughs> theory of relativity right it was not only in science but it also happened in religion that, that's that theory of relativity is, is spread out oh yeah I don't know about that. oh yeah the, the era of you know how we talk about the romantic era uh, you see that in literature you see it in music but the, the relativity issue also played out in not only science but also religion because now we're reaping the fruit of that What's true for you is true for you, Carol. What's true for me is true for me. Even though we, it would be hard for us to hold the same belief together because they can't both be true. You know, if, if Jesus is the only way to the Father, which is what the Bible says, and you believe that, but I say, well, there's other ways to, to God. You know, there are other ways of salvation. They can't both be right, can they? It's either they're all different ways or there's only one way or there's no way I guess that's another option right see what we're going into now so now you have to get into the word because you have to deal with what is the truth because we believe in an objective truth a truth that is here that we are to seek not a truth that we kind of just make up on our own <laughs> that's a contemporary issue the truth issue and how do you how do you get on the same page just within one church let alone a denomination you know so in what types of truths are the other people believing that uh, I mean, it seems pretty simple to me what, what are the people what is this stuff that people are disagreeing with with well and pick if, a topic if you're a christian here in the church you believe that jesus christ is the way to the salvation so if you don't believe that then you wouldn't be here you wouldn't be a christian you would think but yet there are some christians that are saying well he's one way but there are other ways too what other ways 
Got me. Because I don't believe that. But <laughs> See, it, it is simple until man gets involved. <laughs> Well, like I said in the earlier class, when you go to court and you have to put your hand on the Bible and you put your right hand up and they say, repeat after me, what are we supposed to repeat? The truth. How does that go? What's the whole thing? To swear to tell the truth. Swear to, uh, tell, the tell the truth, the, the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Right. So tell the truth. Don't tell me a lie. Tell me the whole, whole truth. truth, not a little bit of the truth. And then tell me nothing but the truth. I don't want to hear anything else but what is true. Why do we say that? How precious truth is, isn't it? Because you can embellish it, right? And then I could deceive you. Or I could tell you part of the story, but leave out other details, and then I'm deceiving you. Or I could just outright lie and mm. deceive you, right? That's how precious the truth is. So imagine that's in a court of law the civil world. Imagine in the church how important that is. And that's why you see John get passionate about the devil and about sin and about righteousness and about uh, obedience and all that because he's living the divisions that are starting to come up in the church. That's the context. And he lived with Jesus. Yeah. So he knows firsthand. Yeah. Yeah, he's bringing that to bear. Yeah. The other issue, too, is um, he also brings out another point. It's not good enough to just know knowledge of Jesus. It has to also include a relationship with Jesus, a, a personal relationship with Jesus. I remember one time I heard a preacher preaching about that, and he said, a lot of us know about Michael Jordan, right? You know who Michael Jordan is? Right. Okay. We could probably tell you how tall Michael Jordan is, how many three-point shots he took during his career. We could tell you the day he retired from basketball, the day that he played for North Carolina University or University of North Carolina, whatever. A lot of knowledge about the, of uh, Michael Jordan, right? But how many of us know Michael Jordan? Zero. That's the difference between, I could tell you a lot of knowledge. I could read a lot about Jesus in the Bible. But to have a personal experience with him, that brings it to a whole other level. See, and that's something else that John's letter brings out. That if you get into the knowledge side, and that for him was Gnosticism in his day and age, you sometimes get away from the relationship side with Jesus. And that's where that incarnation is so beautiful. Because then you have Jesus, he's not just your Lord and your Savior, but he's also your friend. He's your advocate. He's your shelter. I mean, all those words that we use, you know, um, whether they're from Scripture or maybe our own personal experience with him, all of that um, becomes personal to us. And John, of course, had that personal relationship because he, he walked with him, too. So he was fortunate in that way. So that's, you know, that's something the church has to be aware of. Is it just head knowledge we're teaching or is it more of we know Jesus, you know, from our prayer life, from um, the struggles we've been through, temptations we've we've been through, um, confessions, whatever it might be, you know, do we know him at that level? So it's it's uh, pretty significant what he's trying to hold on to here. So good stuff. I mean, John is is filled with a great deal of things that are important to us as Christians. Um, and that whole thing of Jesus having flesh, of Jesus being the Son of God in the flesh, you have to understand that there were people who could not reconcile that. How could God suffer? God doesn't suffer. God's holy. Um, remember when Jesus would eat with the sinners? Who were the? There were people that didn't like that, right? Why didn't they like that? God doesn't hang around with sinners. God's against sin. Well, yeah, he is. But here was Jesus in the flesh, in the midst of sinners, but yet there to save sinners. So he remained, He didn't get tainted. As John says, he remained without sin. Um, but there's the tension. 
you know, there's there's the tension there. And some people could never, and then let alone God died. God experienced death. There's no way. God's eternal. How could God experience death? See, that's hard. And that's that mystery of faith. How did that all come together? God knows. So what you got with 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John is probably second, maybe third generation of the church that was already beginning to experience some of the birth pains of becoming the church. You know, what are the early struggles uh, that the church was dealing with? And of course, we know the Nicene Creed is, came out of that hundreds of years later now from this. But it's just starting. So you get insight here, which is pretty neat. Any other comments or thoughts about 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John? What? One, one verse. Okay. Made, and I must have thought about this for hours. Like, because I, I get myself into these little things. <laughs> you know, I do. It, it's 2nd John, and um, I guess it would be... Um, well, it says, although I have much to write to you, mm -hmm. I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk with you face to face mm -hmm. so that our joy may be complete. Mm -hmm. First, I didn't know what it meant. You know how like, you can go into your whole thing. And I thought, he wrote the Bible. What are you, what, what's he talking about? Like, not use pen and ink. Well, this is a letter. But... But this is, you know, how like you can get yourself into craziness, <laughs> and 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 then I would rather come face to face. I think that's telling, at least to me, after I calmed myself down and said, "Look, you dummy, that's not what it's talking about at all." To me, it's that's why we come to church, mm -hmm. face to face, or that's why you have a Bible study face to face. Because I could read something one way. Mm -hmm. When you said like your opinion and this opinion and the truth and all that, I mm -hmm. could get myself into a real oh yeah dilemma. Mm -hmm. But there are some times when the message talks directly to me. It wasn't meant for anybody else in that congregation that day. That was said for me. So I, I think it just stressed upon me how important that is. Face mm. to face, instead of just reading it. Mm. Yeah. You know, to discuss it face to face. You have a problem, go face to face. Come mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. Let's mm -hmm. talk to me. Yeah. Don't. I guess yeah. that's what. Yeah. But I, I just thought that was so. That was so great. How many times have we gotten a email or a text, and you read it, and the first time you read it, you're like, what? And maybe your blood pressure goes through the roof. You're like, what? <laughs> and then maybe you get to talk to that person face to face. And you're like, oh, that's not what you meant. <laughs> Right? That's probably happened in one way, shape, or form. And that face-to-face -face makes a difference because you can actually see the person, their face, their mm -hmm. expressions, you know. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a good pickup. He says it there, and he says it in John 3, or 3rd John as well, in verse 13 uh, of the third letter, as he's writing to Gaius. I'd rather not write with pen and ink. And we will talk together face to face. My question is, did they have masks on? No, that's not <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, that, that's a good one. Yeah. Well, I just experienced something like that today. Uh, I got a, f a phone call from my sister, and she got a phone call from our cousin, so she was relaying. And it, it, no, she didn't get the phone. She got an email, and she said she would rather her have called talk to her because she says what does she mean by that I don't understand what she means by that right and she was very upset about it oftentimes that's the way it goes yeah right mm -hmm. and I mean I didn't know what she meant I mean I could give my opinion right but it probably wouldn't be right and uh, so yeah I said, well the only way you're going to find out is you call her right because well it upset her that she didn't call and talk to her personally, but she sent this email, mm -hmm. yeah. which was very impersonal. So. Yeah, because it was an important thing that she was 
relaying to her. Okay. Yeah. But, so, yeah. I mean, I can see where the face to face thing, you know, because I would, that's why I don't like this email and text messages. Like I said, I would never have it because I would never hear my children's voices again. They mm -hmm. would, you know, I, I want to listen to you. I want to hear you when you talk to me. I don't want to, I don't want to read what you, what you have to say. <laughs> yes, but, but yes, that's mom. Just me. Yes, mom. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I've heard my yeah. mom say that. <laughs> yeah. It Even though when we answered the phone, she'd be like, hey, Gail. I'm like, no, mom, this is Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, you guys sound alike. Yeah, yeah but I, I once True. saw um, uh, somebody wrote, you know, uh, emails might be efficient, but there are no substitute for the human voice. True. Yeah. And that's the way I feel. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I think we could all relate. We can. Yep. And imagine there's controversy going on, so that's. Mm -hmm. Even more so, you have to meet face to face and talk about it. Yeah. yeah. Anything um, new that you learned about God in these three books? Or anything that stuck out to you about what John said about God? it was a lot of expectation that like I, I've said before in you know these Bible studies it's a hard thing I mean I don't know you almost felt like you were un, you're unworthy because mm. I don't think that I live up to these things mm -hmm. every day oh, I try but right. Right. I don't know yeah, we all try. Um, he's putting the standard up there for us, but there is. But then, um, you, but then you think, will I ever reach that standard? Will I actually go to heaven? Will I be, you know, hmm. good enough? Or I, I don't know. But I, but I think that the whole thing is that I mean, pushing just how close or how intertwined Jesus and God are mm. because it's through you know it's only through Jesus we're gonna get through God but we're going to get through, God through Jesus mm -hmm. I mean it's not like well all right maybe he'll kind of you know talk to him when he sees him you know when he goes up you know for dinner or something like that no <laughs> they're right there I mean God is Jesus is right you know they're there and, and, and it's like it's almost like saying that's the way I mean, mm -hmm. there's, there is just no question that by believing in and accepting that Jesus this is the Christ and is, is the one that's going to forgive your sins, yes, you're not going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. But don't worry about it if you're believing in Jesus because he's going to take care of it. He's going to forgive you. He's going to bring you to the Father and say, hey. I wasn't worried about it, so I read these books. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I started but, reading but the Bible. <laughs> it's a choice. There's no, a lot of absolute. Like yeah, a lot of absolute statements that say, if you do this, forget it. And mm -hmm. I read that, and I'm like, all right, where's that other verse that says there's forgiveness again? So <laughs> I need that because this is a really absolute statement that says, no, forget it. But I think, and I think that might be what you're talking about, too. So right. when you do read through it, you have to you have to piece it all together. Because, I, I mean, just doing the, the reading through Matthew and some of those things that we read with Evan, there's a lot of... Uh, a harsh but absolute, you know, mm -hmm. black and white, you know, and then you kind of have to. And uh, since we are human of and of the flesh, I mean, how can we, how can we be that right. way? I, exactly. I well, I think that's that's the key. Like um, when we think, well, there's no way I can ever get to heaven. It's like, yeah, you never will. Not just Carol, Man. but in Christ, mm -hmm. all the way. And it's just having the faith to trust him on that one you know 
Because what's our, our inane problem is I got to do something. Yeah, I just, I, I, God, just tell me what to do. I'm going to do it. Just tell me what I need to do to get saved. Just, I, I know it's got to be something. I got to do something. I, I don't know what it is. Do I have to go to church a hundred times in my lifetime or so many Sundays in a row or um, I don't know. What is it? Mm. You know? And it's like, no, no, no. You don't. You just have to trust me on this one. But this is the hardest part for us. Right. Trusting that he did it all. And and we all get there sometimes, you know, we get into it and we're like, and then you gotta like, ah, I'm falling into that trap again. Um, I'm not worthy, but that doesn't preclude me from going to heaven. That's exactly why Jesus came to t get me into heaven. We, you know, it's it's tough. Because yeah. A, we don't wanna hear that we're not worthy. We don't like that part. Don't tell me I'm a sinner. I know it, but I don't wanna, I don't like that. You know, when you go to AA, what's the first thing you say when you introduce yourself? Right. Hi, I'm no. Michelle, My name and, I'm an and I'm an alcoholic. The first thing they do is admit their sin. What's the first thing we do when we come into God's presence? Hi, Lord, I'm a sinner. But it, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to accept that because we don't like that. But you but, see all these people in the Bible, even the ones that God handpicked, they were all sinners. Right. They all right. did bad. I mean, look at right. David. Right. They all have dead. sinned and fallen all short of the things. glory of God. They all did. Yeah. They, they weren't perfect. Right. Nobody. Only Jesus. And I suppose that's to to help teach us that that is still okay. Yeah. As long yeah. as you still keep coming around full circle. <laughs> yeah. It, the, you know, uh, the, the repentant heart is what Jesus looks for. Um, as long as we feel sorrow over our sins, that's the that's the door that opens to Christ. And I think we feel that, you know, um, that's what makes us feel unworthy. But that's the very heart that Jesus looks for, because that's a heart that's open to His love and His grace. So, but basically, we have to ask for forgiveness every day. So. Well, it's. <laughs> yeah, basically. basically right. Yes. It's it's recognizing well it's I mean because what I don't know. Like what some people might call as a sin, some other people might say, Ah, you yeah, know, that's okay. Yeah, well, you know, who ultimately determines that? <laughs> <laughs> There's that, you know, it's true for you, it's not true for me. <laughs> 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 There's that Gnostic coming out. <laughs> yeah. Do as I say, but, not as I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's that humble spirit. You know, the minute we start to think that we're we're pretty good, you know, that's the minute that we forget who we are. Yeah. And the amazing thing is God still loves us despite our sin. Pretty amazing. So, but yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. Another good, and you got away with three books this week, so that was pretty good. You only have one for next week, and that's Jude, and that will be our final one. Jude, the second to the last book, one chapter. So, who would have thought that they would put Revelation and the letters of John together? Hmm, it's in the flow a little bit, yeah, yeah. Well, maybe we'll find out why Jude was stuck right there. Yeah. In between. <laughs> All right. Well, let me uh, close this with prayer. Blessed Lord, we are truly grateful for your unending love and grace to us. Thank you for these teachers of the faith who went through difficult times to try and keep your word uh, pure and true um, as they learned it from you. Thank you for uh, men like John who uh, persevered even in the midst of being exiled and um, eventually killed. Help us to have uh, a faith that keeps on learning and growing uh, out of love for you and for the church. And help us Lord uh, in times of controversy to remember that one of the greatest commandments is to love you and to love one another. Uh, Lord, help us to be your true church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.
Did you sign? Yeah.